There is only one place to start a tour of the Dawley district in the late 50s and 60s, and it is the street. Situated in the middle of Dawley, it was the heart of the town. Everybody called it, the street, even though it was actually two streets. The main part, was the Dog's Leg High Street, containing most of the shops, and where you could meet most of the population at some point, especially on a Saturday morning. If you weren't there doing your shopping, you were simply standing around, looking for a chat with whoever might be around. Since most people there were local, you would find someone you knew. Dawley people, really, were a friendly lot. The first part of the street was a Burton Street, even though Dawley seemed to have nothing to do with the Staffordshire town of Burton at all. This is where we begin our trip down the street in the 50s and 60s. At the very top of Burton Street, behind a three-foot stone wall, stood a ramshackle wooden shed of a building, which was Billy Wilkes's undertaker's yard. Wood lay all over the place. However, he didn't seem to have much competition in the town, so he was always busy. Next was the police station. It was quite a large building that seemed too big for the town, with Sergeant Davies in charge if I recall. Next was the Royal Exchange pub, which gave way to a side road into an open area called Blues Hill. It was here in 1950s, where the ice cream factory was situated. The owner, Mr. Maruzi produced ice cream here, which won lots of awards. Because of this he once served free ice creams to all the school children, which people talked about for years afterwards. On the opposite side of the road was, the cozy cinema. Much of the smallish building was of black. Corrugated iron, with a pointed roof, and the picture house was fronted by a plaster facade. You entered a rather cramped foyer, through an outer door, and faced an even more cramped little box that was the ticket office. During the mid-50s a certain number of double seats were put in, for those young couples whose main interest was, not the film being shown. In the event of bad weather, the rain would hit the metal roof, and you could not hear the film. Burton Street's little shops were only on one side of the road. They included a newsagent's, a bread shop, and a pet shop. Opposite, stood the red brick building, the old folks' restroom. On the right, the Elephant and Castle public house stood on the dividing line between Burton Street and the main high street. To the right was Melia's grocery store, which sold almost any grocery item you needed. In here were lined up tins of loose biscuit with glass tops. You could buy a bag of broken biscuits here for a few pennies. The most striking feature at the top end of the high street was the elegant brick facade of the old market hall. It had a tall clock tower as its centerpiece and some lower, rounded arches. This is where the market was held many, many years ago, but shops were situated here in later years. The gas office and Charlie Jondrell's butchers were two I remember. The adjoining shop was where people carried their accumulators, quite heavy glass containers with a handle at the top for recharging to power their wireless sets. Another feature of the market hall area was the main bus stop for those traveling towards Wellington, the nearest town of any size. The bike shop on the other side of the road was if I recall, Taylor's. Bikes were lined up outside and the smell of rubber and newness was evident. Priest's shoe shop was next and was the oldest business in the street, selling shoes here for many years. Collis's TV shop was where you could get a TV on the Never Never. You could get a TV with a slot in and feed money in through the slot, which enabled you to watch the programs. Colin Evans had a drapery store, selling everything you required to make your clothes, and his son Peter ran a gents clothing shop next door, where you could buy the latest fashion items. Norgrove's butchers a bit further down were renowned for their pork pies, scratchings and other meat products. Fred was well known and a very likeable chap. They had a slaughterhouse at the back, just off Meadow Road, where they slaughtered and prepared the meat. 
Kendall's Record and Electrical Shop was next, where you could go and listen to the latest records in small booths, before buying. After the turn-off for Meadow Road was another grocery store. I seem to recall it was called, Fine Fair. The Talbot Pub was next, with Trusty Savings Bank, and Lewis's newsagents. Near was Jarvis's shop. And Mrs. Jones also had a fishmonger's. Fresh fish was a relatively cheap and popular meal in those days. Over the road was Dawley High Street Methodist Church. It was the strangest looking building, made of blue brick and having an Italianate tower. To attend worship, you had to scale a steep flight of stairs before entering the main body of the church. The church was perched on something called the Lightmore Fault, and people often said that it must be a potentially dangerous state of affairs having the church on a fault line. Harold, Chippy Wright kept a successful fish and chip shop a bit further down. There would always be a long queue, usually spilling out, onto the pavement. It was renowned to be the best fish and chips in the area. You could go in and get six penneth of chips and some batter bits. A real treat. Over the road was Woolies Wholesale Premises, and next was Bullock's Shop. Split into two. One being stationery and toys, and the other part being a ladies' clothes shop. Back across the road was The Crown Inn, run by Don Haycox. Bem Roses was next. A typical chemist's shop, sporting tall bottles of coloured liquid, in one of its windows. A young Edith Pargeter, later better known as the well-known author, Ellis Peters had also helped behind the counter at Bimrose during the 1930s. Back on the other side of the road was Panther's Green Grocery Shop. Here I recall going in on occasions and asking for two penneth of bruised fruit. You would get a brown paper bag full of bruised fruit, but with a bit of biting the bad bits out, you could fill your belly. Next was Bailey's The Butcher's, another, successful butcher's shop. The cafe came next. This was in my time, run by my schoolmate, Arthur Brown's, mom. Amongst the several shops along the lower end of the street, was the squat little bread and cake shop, run by the Watts family. Here on winter Saturdays, you could purchase a penny loaf, a miniature lump of bread, costing the said sum of a penny, as a special treat on the way home, from a visit to the matinee at to the cosy. The post office was situated, roughly in the middle of the shopping area, and rather like the chemists, it seemed a solid, reliable sort of place, where important needs could be met in a sympathetic atmosphere. Harris and Holland was next. This was two shops. One was a hardware store, selling anything from a few tacks to a large garden implement along with paraffin. A glass-roofed building, next door, was where chinaware was sold. Variety Phillips was next. It sold furniture in my day, usually on the Never Never, but at one point I believe, he would sell anything, hence the nickname Variety. The Ball Brothers grocery shop was next, selling groceries. I remember the fancy bacon slicer they had in there. Frankie Batch's tiny newsagents and fancy goods shop was also nearby. Frank's window display needed to be seen to be believed. As each carton of new merchandise arrived at the shop, he would split open the top and simply tip the contents onto the existing heap of stock already pressed against the front window. On Saturday evening the pink paper would arrive with all the football scores and reports in. There would be a big queue waiting for the van to arrive the street opened out at the bottom end, with the cream-painted Lord Hill Hotel and public house there. To the right was the library, which was once an old chapel. Here was situated outside Captain Webb's memorial which in previous years was in the centre of the road. Captain Webb was the first man to swim the English Channel in 1875 and was Dawley's most famous son. Nearing the end of the walk, down the street now. But a couple of items more need to be mentioned, although they were not in the street. 
The Dun Cow Pub was situated at the top of the Dun Cow Bank, or Bonk, as it was known. A bowling green was at the back, along with an annex which hosted parties. Behind the annex was the main bus stop. Just a piece of rough ground, it was the destination of a few local bus operators. Over the road was Maud Fenn's shop. A popular stop to buy sweets, on your way to and from school. Well that's it. I hope you enjoyed this walk through the street, that I knew in the late 50s and 60s.